The reason I want to start in the book of Ephesians is because of this. Because there is something that lacks in our own understanding. And Ephesians really poured it out. Paul poured his heart out to the Ephesians with this open heaven. And how we are seated together in heavenly places. And how we come into these heavenly places with every, all spiritual blessings. And so these heavenly places, he's opening up to the Ephesian church because of their eyes being blinded, their eyes not, not be, yeah, their eyes being blinded to the understanding that's already, that's, that, that God, what God has done for them. And so let's look in, let's start in Ephesians 1. And you know, I, I was writing the scriptures up on the board ahead of time and all that, but I think sometimes that can be a little bit of a distraction because you end up looking up all the scriptures when you're trying to get <laughs> so, so it says here in verse 3 in Ephesians chapter 1, it says, Blessed be to the God, it says, Blessed be to the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, who has blessed us with all spiritual blessings in heavenly places in Christ. Now one thing we got to realize, and we'll, we'll look down a little bit further, where it, it talks about, and yeah, let me have a look real quick too. And I think it's actually in this chapter. So this is, yeah, right there in the first chapter, this is where Paul's trying to address this issue that he found at the Ephesian church. And it's, you know, he's talking right there in verse 3. He says that all spiritual blessings, he talks about these it says, it says that blessed be to the, God, to the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. This is how he's opening up to the church in Ephesus. He says, who has blessed us with all spiritual blessings in heavenly places in Christ. In the anointed one, in, this, in, in what's been established, in this word that was with God before the foundations of the earth. In this word, it says, now in the beginning was the earth. Was, was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God, and then it goes on later down, it talks about this light that goes into the darkness. We were just talking about, this. we were talking about love the heavens in instead of loving the hell out. And, and um, it, it, what it says, it says in verse 5 in John chapter 1, I'm bouncing around a little bit, but that's cool, I was doing that last week too. <laughs> And at John 1, 5, it says, The light has come into the darkness. And the darkness, King James says, The darkness comprehended it not. But when you look in the original Greek language, it says this. It says, The darkness couldn't apprehend. The darkness couldn't hold the light prisoner. The darkness couldn't captivate the light. And so the light came into the darkness, and the darkness couldn't, it couldn't captivate that light. It couldn't hold that light prisoner. And so this is what Paul's trying to talk to the Ephesian church about. Because in verse 18, he says this. And here he is talking. We can read the, you can read the things in between. But in verse 18, he, he, he says this. He says, um, well, let me back up. In verse 16, it's talking. He ceased not to give thanks for them. Because, yeah, Ephesians 1, 16. And if I'm going too fast, stop me because I don't want to. I don't want to. I don't want to run anybody over. <laughs> so. Mm -hmm. See, and that's what we were talking about. And that's what the original Greek, Greek language says. And even says, if you look up in the Strong's, it even says, hold prisoner. Yeah. And so it, it, the darkness cannot hold the light prisoner. And so when you go back into verse 16, or well, let's start at the beginning of a sentence. So let's go back to 15. 
It says, Wherefore, I also, after I heard of your faith in the Lord Jesus and, and love unto all the saints, cease, cease not to give thanks for you, making mention of you in my prayers, that the God of our Lord Jesus Christ, the Father of glory, may give you the spirit of wisdom and revelation in the knowledge of him. So this is what we're going to talk about in the next few weeks. The spirit of wisdom and revelation in the knowledge of him. Because that's what the open heavens are all about. So it says, that they, verse 18, The eyes of your understanding being enlightened, that ye may know what is, what is the hope of his calling, and what the riches of the glory of his inheritance in the saints. So this is what this is this is Paul's desire for the Ephesian church. He sees their dedication, he sees their love, but there's something that's missing, and it's the, that eyesight of who they really are. And so that's what that's that's what we're gonna get into is who we really are in Christ Jesus. Because otherwise, if he didn't feel this way about the Ephesian church, he, he wouldn't have talked about it five different times in the book. And twice in the book, in, in right there in the first chapter. So in verse 19, it says, And what is the exceeding greatness of his power to us words? So he's still talking about those open eyes. This is what you got to see, the exceeding greatness of his power to us word, or to us, <laughs> usens who believe according to the work of his mighty power. In verse 20, which he wrought in Christ when he raised him from the dead and set him at his own right hand in heavenly places. Now, if he set Jesus at his own right hand, what did Peter say? He said that we are, no, Colossians, it said it in Colossians. It said that we, it says, we are risen with him. So it's, we are risen with him. So when he rose from the dead, we rose from the dead with him. Does that make sense? And I think I wrote that scripture down. Let, let's have a look at that because I don't want to, um, I, I don't want to whack your head out. Colossians chapter 3. Who can find Colossians chapter 3? Colossians chapter 3, oh, let, let me see, I lost it. 3 1, right? The very first verse. Okay. Then he says, He's risen with Christ. Seek those things which are above, where Christ sitteth on the right hand of God. Okay, so if you were risen with Christ, when Christ rose from the dead, we rose with him. So when we were, were risen with Christ, think about the things that are above, right? And it, says, it said in another place in Colossians, it says, set your, your things above and not beneath. That's right. Because, and, and we're going to find this when we get into the book of Revelation. Don't be scared. <laughs> we're going to find this when we get into the book of Revelation because when, 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 when Paul, and, and let's get into this. John, John said this in Revelation 4. Yeah, Revelation 4. And I, I had to stop this because I, I had to stop here when I was looking at Revelation 19 and I bounced back to 4. I said, well, man, I can't skip over this part, but this needs to go first. And then also, um, Revelation 4, let's see, we had it in our sheet here. What? Yeah, right there in the first verse, Revelation 4.1. So this is it. He says, come up hither and I will show you what's going to take place after these things. What's he going to show us? In, in, in the book of, of, of Psalms, it says he's going to show us the path of life. And we were talking about that last week with the tree of, the, the tree of life in the garden. 
and how that path to the tree of life, that way to the tree of life, has been preserved for us. And how, how the angels at the gate are there to preserve that way to the tree of life because there's no incorruptible seed that can make it to the tree of life. We can't do anything in ourselves. We can't do anything to change anything in ourselves. Willpower will only take us so far. But there is something when we, when we humble ourselves and we become, we come before the hand of God. And we, 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 we uh, it says, humble yourself in the mighty hand of God. Here I go again. And he would do what? He will exalt you in due time. I can't even remember what that was. It was in one of the, one of the epistles in the end, I think. Either, in, in either Peter or John said that. I'm not sure. But I think it's in one of the epistles. It says, humble yourself under the mighty hand of God because he wants to exalt you. He wants to lift you up. He wants, you to, bring, he wants to bring you into these heavenly places. Come up hither. Come up a little higher. That's another one of those songs I want to put on that sheet. And in, in mine it says, I will show you things that must take place after this. Exactly. Trust in the Lord with all your heart. Proverbs 3, 5, and 6. Trust in the Lord with all your heart. Don't lean on your own understanding. In all your ways, acknowledge Him. And He's going to do what? He's going to direct your path. He's the one that directs your path. Come on up. Come on up. Come on up. Come on up. Because he's going to direct your path. He's going to show you something that you've never seen before. And sometimes we think that we've arrived. You know, and the whole thing is, this is a journey. This is a journey that ne that's ne never ends because it's such a wonderful journey. And that he's going to show us things to come. And his word is a lamp unto our feet and a light unto our path. But the thing is, there's, this, there's what, this thing that Paul has established to the Ephesians. There's this thing that John has established to all of us. As he showed the revelation of Jesus Christ. And what's this revelation of Jesus Christ say here in, John, in Revelation 4? Come on up a little higher. Come up and join me. I got to show you the next step. And here's one thing you look at repentance. A lot of people look at repentance and, and they say to repent is something where you, you know, you, you go down and there's, there's, a, there's, a, a, there's a brokenness of heart where you're asking for forgiveness, but then the repentance is a little bit different. Repentance, you know, uh, one, one definition means to turn around. And, 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 you know, and, and do a 180. But the, when you look at the, at the, when you break up the root words of, of repentance, it means, and you look at the pinnacle of a mountain, the penthouse in the building, where are they? They're always on top. So what does it mean? It says get back on top. There's something that God has established for you, for you before the foundations of the earth. And corruption got in. That corruptible seed gets in the way. That's something that Adam messed up on. And there's this old Adamic creation inside of us that took us from that pinnacle. So what God, what's God saying? He says, repent. Get back on top. Get back on top. Turn around. Don't look at the way you're looking at things. And he's not just talking, he's not just talking to the old sinner man, but he's talking to us too. Don't look at the way that you look at things. Don't look at this over here. Don't look at that over there. He says, if the righteous scarcely be saved, he says, where is the ungodly and the sinner? But there's something that's ungodly in the views that we, that we may have sometimes. And, that, you, you know, people talk about the Antichrist, but the only, way, only places you find Antichrist mentioned is in the epistles of John. And what does it refer to? It, re it refers to a spiritual condition. It refers to something, anything that's against the divine plan, will, and purpose of God. And that's the only thing that John, John talked about when he talked about the Antichrist was three times in the epistles of John. Get back on top. Let your mindset be on him. 
Let, let everything that you do, every step that you take, and like I said last week, man, we're going we're gonna, to we're gonna waver a little bit. You know, we're going to get distracted over here, but keep your eyes on that destination. Keep your eyes on the destiny. Keep your eyes on where you're going. Yeah, yeah and, and you might get a little shaky when you look over here, but put your eyes on that final destination. Don't let that slip away from you. Don't let that don't let that affect you. Yeah, when you when you get your eyes back on that, when Peter was walking on the water, he had a destination. He had a destination right in front. Jesus was standing right walking right in front of him, and he knew where his destiny was. But then he got stepped out of that boat and he started to walk on the water and he looked to his left and he looked to his right and he saw something he had no control over. But when he got his eyes back on his destination, he was able to walk in that water and walk back to that boat with his loving Savior. And so we, 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 those things will happen in our lives. But here's your destiny right in front of you. Here's your destiny right in front of you. A loving Savior. And as, as we look to Jesus, looking unto Jesus, what? The author and the finisher of our faith. Looking unto Jesus. Wow, so where are these heavenly places found? In Christ Jesus. It's so simple, Carl. It's so simple. Our heavenly places are found in Him. Christ and Christ alone. What did Paul say to the Corinthian church? He says, I'm not interested in, in your fancy speech, what you think you might know. He says, all I want to know is Jesus Christ and Him crucified. That's all I need to know. And, you know, and, and sure, there's other things that, that'll, that'll come that we learn and we grow in. But, you know, when he was talking to the Corinthian church, man, they can get wrapped up in doctrine. They can get wrapped up in, in, in philosophy and everything else. Of course, they're Greeks. Greeks love philosophy, you know. <laughs> you know, that's, that's, that's part of being a Greek, right? <laughs> But then, the, so Paul had to address that. He says, I don't care about that stuff. All I care about is Jesus Christ and Him crucified. I remember there was this online interview that I, that I, that I took one time. It was about an hour long program. And we were streaming, he was in Florida, I was here in Portland. And, and it was near the end of the interview and we were talking about I went through the book of Hebrews quite a bit, and that frustrated him. He didn't like that. Then I realized why he didn't like it, because he took about maybe a minute and a minute and a half, something like that. That's, that's quite a decent amount of time trying to convince me that Jesus didn't need to go to the cross, that his blood didn't need to be shed. You know, and how can a loving father really do that to his son? And I realized, and I, I had to stand, I had to stand my ground, say, no, without the shedding of blood, there's no remission. And I mean, yeah, he brought up two or three times, and, you know, like I said, minute and a half, when you're on a program like that, that's, that's a decent amount of time to try to convince somebody, you know. <laughs> you can't do away with the blood of Jesus. Because that's the redemption. That's what our redemption is. And as many times as the book of Revelation refers to and even talks about an open heaven, we have to remember what the book of Revelation is all about. It's the revelation of Jesus Christ. It's the revelation of Jesus Christ. And he says, come on up a little higher. Come up hither. And he says, come up hither and I will show you what? Things to come. I will show you things that you never thought you can see in your own eyes because you're not using your own eyes. You're seeing through what I, what I see. When Moses, God said to Moses, and this is just a, a, a thought, when God said to Moses, you know, because of, uh, 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 you know, they were getting ready to come in the, in the promised land and it was time for Moses to go because of, uh, of some of the things he did in the wilderness. 
And, and, and he says, all you're going to see is my hinder parts. And he says, I want to see, you know, I want to see the promise. And he says, and God told me that you'll see my hinder parts. Well, I remember a few years ago, Marilyn and I were in a home meeting. And it was a pretty packed meeting, you know. And she was sitting in front of me. And my buddy Dean was sitting across the room. And I was thinking about this scripture. And I looked up and I saw Dean across the room. I saw the picture behind him and everything. He was sitting on the couch. And I realized that I could see the back of Marilyn's head. So what, what I was seeing, I was seeing her hinder parts. And when I looked at that, I could see what was ahead. And so when God, when, when Moses wanted to see the promised land, he saw God's hinder parts and he saw what God saw. And what, was, what did he see? He saw revelation. He saw, through, he, saw the, he saw through the eyes of God, he saw what God saw. And, and, and um, you know, the Bible says, and I think it's in the book of Psalm, to where it talks, my ways are not your ways, and my thoughts are not your thoughts. And this is why we, we come into this place of an open heaven. Because I think in Revelation 4, it talks about, it talks about a door open in heaven, right? Is that, is that the way it said? Who, who had that? A door was open. And it was like the voice of a trumpet. How many people ever heard a trumpet talk? Me. Your son played the trumpet. There you go. So, so here's the thing. A voice as a trumpet. And it, yeah, Isaiah 58, 1 says this. It says, cry aloud, spare not. Lift up your voice like a trumpet. Show my people their transgressions and the house of Jacob their sins. Our voice will shine as a trumpet. Because why? That doorway in heaven has been opened up. And the voice that comes out of us, not to build ourselves up, but would be, would be fashioned by the voice of the Lord. When we come into these open heavens and we allow ourselves to allow our eyes to see what God has established for us. Now unto him that is able to do far exceedingly above all that we ask or think according to what? According to what's already been established inside of us. Paul had a lot of things to say to the Ephesians, didn't he? That was Ephesians 2.20, by the way. And this was Paul's focus on a wonderful people, on a people that loved God and a people that loved others, you know? And they, the dedication that they had in their heart. But to be blinded from their inheritance. Can you imagine that, John? To be blinded from your own inheritance. Uh, this is what Paul's prayer for them. And he, in, in a passion prayer, he says he prayed, he prayed what many times for them. That their eyes may be enlightened to the riches of the calling of their inheritance that their eyes might be enlightened to those heavenly places. What do you say here now? Let's have a look at some of these scriptures. We, we went through to uh, uh, Ephesians chapter 1. In, in verse 3, he was talking about all these spiritual blessings in heavenly places. And it went down to verse 18, where he wants their eyes to be opened to what he's talking about for them. And in verse 20, it's, it, 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 it says, uh, who's got uh, Ephesians 1 opened up? What does it have to say? Uh, verse 20. That's right. And when he raised Christ from the dead, what did we say? When he raised Christ from the dead, we were raised with him. We were raised with him. So there's something inside of us. If this was established in, with, in Jesus, right? If you set him on the right hand of the Father, and, and how to say it again? Which he brought him Christ when he raised him from the dead and set him at his own right hand in the heavenly place. 
in the heavenly places. See, this is where he's intended us to be seated. And it's nothing that, it's, it's nothing in the sweet, sweet by and by, which is okay, but I tell you something, there's something he's established right here inside of us. Ephesians 2, 6, let's have a look at that real quick. See, this is it. We are in him. He made us to sit together in heavenly places here and now in Christ Jesus. We were risen with him. We were risen, and I'm not going to say we're, but, but it, it, it really is the case. But the reason I don't want to say it that way is because, you know, people kind of look at you weird and say, well, you think you're Jesus. No, I don't think I'm Jesus. I just know my brother. So we were risen as him. Because he dwells in us. It's that same spirit that raised Christ from the dead. Romans chapter 8, 11. It dwells in you. It's going to do what? It's going to make you come alive. That same spirit. You know, you, you, you like some of those old songs. You know those old songs. It's the reason you like them. What does it say? That same spirit that raised Christ from the dead dwells in you. Dwells in you. If that same spirit that raised Christ from the dead, you know too, dwells in you, dwells in you, it will quicken your mortal body. If that spirit dwells in you, it will quicken their mortal body. If that spirit dwells in you, so what's been established inside of you, if that same spirit that raised Christ from the dead is established inside of you, it's going to bring you to life. And we can be living, we can be living like Adam in a, in a case of this fallen Adamic creation, which is what? This day, God said to him, you should do what? You should surely die. There's a separation that we have from God. It's a, it, it, it's a separation that, we, that, that says we will surely die because our life is found in him. And see, when we come to this place and that same spirit that raised Christ from the dead finds its habitation in us. When it finds its dwelling place in us, when it finds its resting place in us, it's going to quicken our mortal body. It's going to bring us back to the life that God intended before the foundations of the earth. That's in Romans wow. 8, 11. Romans 8.11, yeah. It's going to bring us back to what God intended for us before the foundations of the earth. So when this separation became king with Adam, this day you should surely die. And he went ahead and naturally lived another 900 years. Did he make God a liar? No. But there was a spiritual separation. There was a, a, there was a decay that was inside of him. There was death that was established inside of him because of what happened in the garden. But God knew. Can you imagine... Adam in the garden eating from the tree of life and here's a God that, that, that created everything. He sees all, he knows all and everything else. And here's Adam that eats from this tree. He goes, oh my me. You know, he couldn't say, oh my God, because he was God, right? No, he knew what was going to happen. You should surely die. God knew from the fact, be, before Adam even existed, he was in the mind of God and he knew what was going to happen in that garment, uh, garden and he brought, he brought redemption right around. Wow. And just like that scripture that we read in, in, in Ephesians chapter 3, that was a hot scripture. Where, where was that? Um, yeah, where was that? Ephesians 3... Yeah, and it says, for this cause, in verse 1, for this cause, I, Paul, the prisoner of Jesus Christ for you Gentiles, he found himself to be captivated in Christ. Found himself to be a prisoner. Jeremiah said this, he says, it says, no matter what I do, I could turn to the left, I could turn to the right, but there's something inside of me that's like a fire that's shut up in my bones that just makes me get my eyes back on that destiny. No matter what I do, there's something inside of me that draws me back like a moth to the flame. It's like a fire that's shut up in my bones 
I got to go this way. And so Paul, he says, I'm a prisoner to Christ. It's almost like that same fire that Jeremiah felt inside of him. Went no matter what he did. And I mean, Paul, I tell you what, Paul was, uh, one thing I, I love about Paul, he was able to show his vulnerability. Because you look in the, in the, in the book of Galatians, he says, and, and to where he is talking to the, book of, to, to the Galatian church, and he says, I know last time I was with you, I kind of messed up. He says, forgive me in my folly. And so, so Paul was a vulnerable, he was transparent, and, and showing us that even if you go to the left or to the right, like Peter, when he was looking at those waves, he looked to the left and to the right, and he saw something he couldn't handle. He saw something he had no control over, but then he looked to the source of his strength. Paul looked to the source of his strength. He says, I've done all this stuff in my life, he says, I've, I've been the Pharisee of Pharisees. I've done this, I've done that, and I've done this. He says, none of that is worth anything. He says, it's like a pile of I don't want to say. Because of something that was established inside of him, he had to say, he says, I press on towards that mark of the high calling found in Jesus Christ. We, sometimes we, we, we see these things and we find the grace of God in the middle. You find the grace of God that draws us back. And that makes it even stronger. That makes it even more wonderful than ever before. You know, people, people talk about you, you can hear too much grace, too much grace. No, you can't. Because the grace of God is what leads us. I, I've heard some people say that. And they think because, because grace, they think, well, when you hear grace, well, that means you can do whatever you want. God's always going to draw you back. You know, that kind of thing. Greasy grace, yeah, that was another thing they used to say. But, uh, but there's something about what's been established. Peter had to go through that experience about seeing the, seeing the waves and the storm because there was something that was established inside of him at that point in his life. He recognized the source of his strength. Paul had to find these times where maybe he didn't, find, he wasn't, didn't feel as strong as he should be because he found the source of his strength. Romans chapter 7, he says, Man, when I, when I try to do good in myself, evil is present with me. And he says, no matter what I do, he says, man, I try to work this out. He's so wretched man that I am. Who's going to deliver me from this body of death? But then he went and said, I, he said, I thank God through Jesus Christ. I'm not subject to this stuff. But I'm subject to the law of God that's been established in me. Then he went on to say, there is therefore no condemnation to those that are found in Christ Jesus. No condemnation. After the Spirit, not after. And you know something, if you look at that, that's italicized, and that's not even in the original manuscript. There's no condemnation to those that walk. That to those that are in Christ Jesus. There's no condemnation to those that are in Christ Jesus. And when you look that up in the original manuscript, that last part's not even in there. And I'm not saying that you can do whatever you want. You know what I mean? And, you know, it's funny that, that in Ephesians, in Eph here I go again, Ephesians chapter 5, uh, Galatians, Galatians chapter 5, you know, where it talks about the works of the flesh and the fruit of the Spirit. Isn't it funny that when it talks about the works of the flesh, it's works. But when it's talking about the fruit of the Spirit, it's something that's established. It's a fruit inside of you. And so, so what, what's that saying? It says the stuff we do in the flesh is nothing but a labor. It's nothing but this work that goes on. But when we, when we took a look at the things in the Spirit, the fruit of the Spirit, wow. You think we'll ever get through this heaven thing? <laughs> we will. We will. We will. Because here we go. Ephesians chapter uh, 5, 21. The fruit of the Spirit is... 
Okay. I think it's 21. The fruit of the Spirit. Is it? In the, uh, Galatians, uh, Galatians. Galatians, I'm sorry. <laughs> I'm plowing the road, yeah. I'm not plowing the road, I'm bulldozing it. I, I need to slow down. Galatians chapter 5, verse 21. Uh, let's let's just do what what's twenty one say? Okay, twenty one says envy, murder, drunkenness, revelation. Oh, go down, go down further, where it talks about the fruit. Twenty two. That the fruit of the spirit is love, joy, peace, long-suffering. Okay, so the fruit of the spirit is love, love, joy, joy, peace, peace, long-suffering, long-suffering. What comes after that? Um, gentleness. Gentleness. Goodness. Goodness. Faith. Faith. Meekness. Meekness. Temperance. Temperance. Against such there is no law. And above that such there is no law. Check this out. The fruit of the Spirit is love. Right? Mm -hmm. Love. Out of that love. Comes your joy, comes your peace, comes your long suffering, comes gentleness, kindness. All of these things come out of the love of God. The honest, true love of God. The unescapable love of God. The unconditional love of God. So what happens? Everything is surrounded by the love of God. It's unwavering. And so when you look at this, now what does that look like to you? When you're looking at that, what does it look like? The sun. Love is the core. Let's have a look at it that way. Have you ever seen those apple things to where you can, it, it, it's got these, the, yeah. yeah, it's got these blades around it and you can just push that down and you end up with the center, huh? You have one. You end up with the core in the center, right? And then what do you have? Nine slices of apple all the way around. And, uh, oh no, eight slices yeah. of apple all the way around. And then you have that core in the middle. Well, see, this is, like, this is like getting one of those slicers, right? So here you have, here you have your core, right in the middle. Yeah. Then here's your eight slices coming out of it, right? But where's the life at? It's in the, it's in the seed. It's in the core. So the life of, uh, of the Spirit is right there. It's the love of God. So the fruit of the Spirit is love. And out of that love comes the joy, comes the peace, comes the long-suffering, comes all of that. Mm -hmm. there's, a, there's a miracle that happens with nutrition. The most nutritious thing on the earth is a seed when it germinates. Now a seed itself is nothing. You take a broccoli seed and you chew it, Mm -hmm. But it germinates and it ends up with a universe full of vitamins and trace minerals wow. and really exotic things. And the scientists, it's a miracle, the scientists cannot figure out why this is. I mean, the wheat, wheat, um, you've heard of wheat grass too. Right? Mm -hmm. oh, yeah, yeah. So when the thing is this tall, it's just filthy with all these nutrients. By the time it gets to wheat, wheat up to put it here. The yellow stalks, you can chew on that, it's just nothing. Or you can take the wheat seeds out and grind it to make flour and eat the flour. No nutrition. It's only when it germinates. It germinates and it's about this tall. Same thing with the sprout, it's about this tall. Like a sunflower seed, there's no nutrients. It germinates and they can't explain why. It just all of a sudden has this huge spectrum of nutrition. It's the most dense, sprouts are the most dense things. Yeah. So this this is pretty awesome what, what, what Tom is saying here. See, because you can have all these signs, outward signs of the Spirit of God. What did Paul say to the Corinthian church? He says, You can speak with the tongues of men and angels. 
right? You can prophesy, you can do all this, but he says without this core, without this core of love, it's what? Nothing but a bunch of noise. Nothing but a bunch of noise having no value. And so I'm glad you brought that up, Tom, because that is so rich. Because unless that seed germinates, it has no life. And what, what did Jesus say? When, unless the seed falls to the ground and dies, because that's what's going to cause it to germinate. It won't have any, what did it say? It won't have any life. I can't remember that. Unless the seed falls to the ground and dies. John 12, 24 is, uh, I tell you, unless this kernel of wheat falls to the ground and dies, it remains only a single seed. But if it dies, it produces many seeds. See, and there's, see how much life is in that? And this is what Jesus had to say, that if that seed falls into the ground and dies and germinates, it'll bring out more fruit. And see, there's a watering of our ground that takes place. And that, to where that, 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 that ground is germinated. We were talking, you know, during the breakthrough in, in uh, uh, Pilgrim's Progress. Have you ever read that book, John? It's written by John Bunyan in in 16th century, and it was actually written while he was in prison. John Bunyan, he was, um, I don't remember all the details about him, but because of his faith, you know, and the Anglican, the king wanted to take over everything and everything else, he was actually put into prison because of the stand he took for his faith. And... Um, he, he, this book was actually kind of like a dream that he had. But there's one portion in the book to where uh, this pilgrim goes into the interpreter's house. Now this pilgrim is on a journey to get to this celestial city. And he had this big weight on his back is, is the way the story goes. And he would find all these places to stop, and then there would be there would always be some kind of revelation that would take place. And there was this house he came to, and it was called the Interpreter's House. And when he went into the house, um, there there was a, a, a parlor in the home that he went into, and this this room had never been cleaned. And I mean, you're talking, it was just filthy with dust and everything else in this room. And so they took a broom and tried to sweep the room clean. But because there was so much dust in this room, all it did was create a cloud of dust. And so the interpreter says, he says, get me a, bo uh, a bowl of water. And with that water, he sprinkled the dust. And after he sprinkled that dust, they could sweep it up clean. And, it's, and so what happens in our lives, we try to stir things up. Willpower only takes us so far. And, and we try to clean ourselves up. And we try to do this cleaning. And even, even Christians, say, you know, they'll try to do this to each other. They'll try to clean this person up, you know. But I tell you, without the washing of the water of the word, there's, they, they, all it does is create a bunch of dust. All it does is cloud the air. But when you, when, you, when you water it down with the water of the word, and you can just sweep that up, you know, and it comes up clean. And, and so that's the whole thing when we allow ourselves to rely on what God has established. When we allow ourselves, what happens when, those, when, the, when the heaven gets opened up, there is a rain that comes down. You know, you say the skies have opened up. What's that? Because of downpour coming, you know. <laughs> there's a downpour coming. And there's a former rain that comes to water the crops. But then there's this latter rain that comes that when, it, when it's time to harvest the crops, to get the crops ready to be harvested. And there's a latter rain that's taking place inside of us. There's a harvest ready to happen inside of us so we can, we can draw the harvest. Uh, through others. Why? Because we are living epistles known and read of men. What does that mean? P 
people look at us and they see the love of God. They're able to see what they, we, we don't have to tell them. Yeah, we got, we, yeah, we open our mouths and we speak the love of God to someone. But I tell you what, they're going to learn more from what, for what God has established inside of us than what they're going to learn from our doctrine that comes out of our mouth. Paul said this to the Corinthian church. Here I go again. He says, I'm jealous of you, for you, with a godly jealousy because you've left your first love. He says, just as Eve was deceived in the garden, so you have been deceived and you're hearing another Jesus. 2 Corinthians 11, 3, 3 and 4, I believe that is. And he says, you followed another Jesus. He says, if I even come to you preaching another gospel, run. <laughs> He said, don't even listen to me. If I come to you preaching another gospel, don't listen to this gospel I'm preaching because the simplicity and the purity of the gospel of Jesus Christ is all you need. And see, it's the anointing that destroys the yoke. You know, I, and I look at it this way too because the Holy Spirit gives us understanding. And I, I look at, if, I, if I'm uh, maybe going down to Phoenix, and if I'm traveling on my own, I like to fly because it's cheaper. <laughs> you, know? you know, if I'm traveling with Maryland, we might drive because it's cheaper. <laughs> but what's that? Well, that's, that's where I'm originally from. Yeah, that's where I'm originally from. But if I got on that plane and I knew that pilot all he did was take a book and learn how to fly a plane. You know, I mean, he could take that plane apart and put it back together as far as he was concerned for that book. And I see him getting into that cockpit. Then I see a co-pilot that's maybe had 30 years experience behind him. He has some real understanding. Which one would I really want to be flying that plane? Someone that has an understanding and not just the book knowledge. David said, and I think I brought this up last week too, in Psalm 51, and it's something, it's, it's, it's a twist if you, don't really, if you don't really know the context of it. And in Psalm 51, verse 3, it says, I acknowledge my transgressions and my sin is ever before me. But there's a word for acknowledge there, and you can tell it's a Hebrew word, it's yada. So, you know, uh, uh, Jerry Seinfeld, yada, 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 you can tell it's. So, um, it, it talks about being a familiar friend and intimately acquainted with. I'm a familiar friend and intimately acquainted with my transgressions and my sin is ever before me because of that. But then you go down to verse 6. And it says that I want you to see truth after the inner parts. That you, may want, that you might know Yada, be a familiar friend and intimately acquainted with my wisdom. We're working that old Adam out of us. And our eyes are being opened to find out that we have an inheritance that's far above. What, what, what did Paul say? Oh, gosh, here I go again. 2 Corinthians chapter 3, where Paul, Paul was talking about the old covenant with Moses. And he says that this glory that Moses had was a lesser glory. He says, how much more is the glory from the Lord that God has given us? He says, you're still sitting here in the thing of Moses. And he says, as Moses had to veil his face because that light of the glory of God that shined through him even though it was an inferior glory, it blinded the eyes of the, of the children of Israel. And here you, he said, here you guys have come into a greater glory than Moses ever had. And he says, you're still wearing this veil over your face to where you can only see through a glass darkly. Everything is, is mud clear to you. But, it, but God is wanting to remove that veil off of our eyes that we can look into his face. We can look into him face to face and, and see the glory of God. And what does it say? The spirit of the Lord is there is liberty, right? Uh, it sounds like both of you gals got it. Yeah, we've heard 
Well, it's talking about the glory. It's talking about the glory that Moses had, and how it was an inferior glory. Maybe, maybe around verse ten. Yeah, I was reading them. I thought nine was eight, but it said. Uh, yeah, start. Actually, it does start in verse nine. Had glory. The ministry of righteousness achieved much more. There you go. That's it. For even what was made glorious had no glory in this respect because of the glory of that itself. So she started in verse 9 and we're reading down because there's only 18 verses in here. But yeah, she started in verse 9 and we're reading down 2 Corinthians chapter 3. For if what is passing away was glorious, what remains is much more glorious. Therefore, since we have such hope, we use great boldness of speech. Unlike Moses, who put a veil over his face so that the children of Israel could not look steadily at the end of what was passing away, that their minds were blinded, for until this day the same veil remains unlifted in the reading of the Old, the Old Testament, because the veil is taken away from Christ. Mm -hmm. But even to this day when Moses is read, a veil lies on their hearts. Nevertheless, when one turns to the Lord, the veil is taken away. Now the Lord is the Spirit, and where the Spirit of the Lord is, there is liberty. But we all, with unveiled face, beholding as in the mirror, the glory of the Lord, are being transformed into the same image, from glory to glory, just as by the Spirit of the Lord. Okay, so what's it talking about? It's talking about this old covenant that was in Moses. It's what? It says this old thing is fading away, right? And in, in the next chapter, Paul kind of keeps up with this thing. And going down to verse 16, it says, For which cause we faint not, but though our outward man, which is part of that law of Moses, which is part of that Adamic creation, though our outward man perishes, the inward man is renewed. What? The inner man is renewed. Day by day, right? Is renewed day by day. For our light affliction, this thing that this light affliction of the law of the flesh, right? This light affliction, but is but for a moment works for us a far more exceeding ter uh, weight in glory. Why? Because it says, while we look at the things that are seen, we look not at the things that are seen, but at the things that are not seen, because the things that were seen are only temporary, but the things that are not seen are eternal. So this is what's going on. See, it, when Moses was talking in chapter 3 and he looks at Moses, this law that Moses had was something that w w was generated in the flesh. You know, there were ten commandments that God gave Moses at, when he, after, before he came down from the mountain. He came down from the mountain with these ten commandments. And guess what? By the time he was finished, there was over 614 different ordinances. And, and that, was, that was over, what, a period of 40 years. 614 different ordinances this dude came up with out of 10 commandments. And so there's this law of the flesh. There's this law of the flesh that says when your kids act up, take them outside the city and stone them. There's this law of the flesh that even in Jesus' time, where here's this woman with the issue of blood, there's this law of the flesh that says she should be treated like a leper and cast out of the city. So here's this woman with the issue of blood having to crawl through because nobody wanted her around because she was like a leper to them and she was able to touch the hem of his garment and be found completely free. So am I doing away with Moses? Am I doing away with the law? Jesus came to fulfill the law, not to destroy it. But there's something we got to remember. There's a law of the flesh that, uh, that, 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 uh, that overwhelms us at times. It, it, well, it does, overwhelms us. But when we allow ourselves to be overwhelmed by the presence of God and we allow these heavens to be opened up, and wow, I don't know if we're ever going to get done with this thing. This might be a year, two years, three years, four years down the road, the way my brain works. But there, when we allow ourselves to be consumed by the presence of God, we are consumed by the breath of his nostrils. Every time we take a breath, we're breathing in the presence of God. Every time we breathe out a breath, we're giving out the presence of God. And so there's a thing inside of us that when the presence of God is consumed every part of our being, 
and we're not subject to this law of man because the law was, was is there to uh, there to appoint to uh, what, what is the schoolmaster. The law is the schoolmaster. That's the word I was looking for. It's what in, in one of the Corinthian books. It says the law is a schoolmaster. When we, when we are rebels, we need a little bit of law in our lives. We need to be able to be taught. And you, know, you, you don't just go kill your neighbor because he, he did something against you, you know? You don't just do this. You don't just go rob a bank because you're short on cash. You don't need it. And, but there's these things that, that when, when you come into the knowledge and the understanding of the love of Christ... All of these things on the outside are pretty unnecessary. All of these things on the outside, yeah, we still need to live, we still need to eat, but all of these things are on the outside are taken care of by the hand of God. All of these things on the outside, prophesying with the tongue of men and angels, being able to feed the poor, all of these things are nothing without the eternal love of God established inside of us. That doesn't mean we... We do away with it. But we find it all fulfilled inside of us with the love of God. I just, this is what was really on my heart today. I wanted to make sure we established this before we started getting into those scriptures because there was something about an open heaven. Paul, man, when he was, when he was talking to the Ephesian church, he was talking out of a heart of love. Man, look at all this stuff you're missing out on. Look at all this stuff you're missing out on. He goes, I don't want you to miss out on this. I want your eyes to be open. You're seated together right now in heavenly places. All spiritual blessings are found in these heavenly places. That's what he told him. He says, Christ was riven, risen into these heavenly places. He says, as Christ was risen in those heavenly places, so are you risen in those heavenly places. So that's what Paul Paul's message was to the Ephesian church. We're in heavenly places here and now. Here and now. When we walk on this old terra firma, there's something inside of us. Not that we're superior. Yeah, you found it? Real quick and then we got to wrap it up, huh? Galatians 3 verse 24. Galatians. Wherefore the law was our schoolmaster to bring us unto Christ, that we might be justified by faith. But after that faith has come, we are no longer under the schoolmaster, which I have feared that law among you. Yeah. For ye are all children of God by faith in Christ Jesus. See, that says it all. That's, I'm glad you found that, because, see, I would have misled you. You'd be looking all in Corinthians and everything. <laughs> he doesn't know what he's talking about <laughs> but it's in Galatians it's in Galatians I like that yeah Google's a big thing isn't it so Father we thank you Lord God that we are established in heavenly places here and now now unto him that is able you said uh, to do far exceedingly above all that we ask or think. It's beyond our imagination. It's beyond anything that we could put together ourselves. It's a bond beyond any doctrine of man. It's beyond any works of the flesh. But it's established inside of us.